All right, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, and today uh, we are going to have uh, uh, consciousness talks on uh, sleep and the consciousness. And uh, uh, we are also going to talk about the dreaming as well, I think. And uh, uh, today's speaker is uh, 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 Jennifer Wint uh, from Monash University, who is a philosopher, but also uh, working on sleep, dream, consciousness. And also, uh, the second speaker is Masako Tamaki from uh, Riken and, uh, in Japan. And she's going to talk about more empirical side of the uh, sleep uh, and consciousness type study. And uh, without further ado, uh, please go ahead, Jenny. Uh, can you share the screen? Yeah. All right. And um, yeah. So just checking again that what you're seeing is um, just the slides and presentation mode and yes. not my comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, which are actually also outdated comments now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, thanks now for the introduction and for organizing this. Um, really, really happy to be doing this and very much looking forward to Masako's talk and seeing how that all comes together. Uh, so what I want to present today is really just a few thoughts on how we're getting really, I think, converging evidence, both from the side of sleep research, sleep evidence on sleep staging, local sleep, neurophysiology, neurophysiology of sleep on one hand, but also from the subjective study of conscious experience in sleep, so of dreaming, um, that really are a classical and continuing way of thinking about sleep and sleep staging, include, including how um, including sleep staging criteria is really outdated and in need of revision. And I'll present some ideas about how we might move forward as well. So the somewhat cheeky question in the background is then do all of these challenges really mean that um, we don't really understand what sleep is? That's perhaps, perhaps a bit too ambitious and a bit too strong, but I do think that converging evidence from the neuroscience of sleep, but also from the science of dreaming is really upending what we thought our understanding of sleep was and how to measure it and really necessitating a new way of thinking about specifically the relation between sleep and waking and consciousness. So just to take you back to the traditional view of sleep, and this is really a view of sleep that harks all the way back to, to antiquity. So here we have Aristotle. It's obviously changed since then in various iterations, but I do think that core aspects of this traditional view have been preserved, partly some of them up until this day. So the traditional view then being that sleep is a state of uniform passivity and rest. There's nothing much going on in sleep. So actually until the 1950s, nobody thought it was even interesting to study sleep, either from the subjective perspective nor from an electrophysiological point of view. Um, sleep was classically taken to be a state where we're dead to the world, we're unconscious, perhaps even by definition unconscious, perhaps with the exception of dreaming. Um, sleep was also classically seen, and again, this is very much part of the Aristotelian view of sleep and wakefulness, that sleep and waking are sharply distinguished, they're opposite states, and one excludes the other. Um, and I'll come back to this idea later on. And it's also a global whole brain phenomenon. It's something that happens to the entire brain. And that, of course, ma matches the view that sleep since the 1950s, since the discovery of REM sleep, has been measured, namely using EEG um, and defining sleep stages um, in terms of whole brain changes in brain activity. Now, what we'll see as I take you through this is that, as I was saying, this traditional view of sleep has already been adapted numerous times, while I think core aspects have been maintained, but I also think that traditional view of sleep is almost completely wrong, and we really need something new. Um, so here, very familiar, and I'll just be very quick with this in view of the time, um, one of the early papers, really founding papers of sleep and dream research on the discovery of rapid eye movement sleep um, and its association with dreaming. So the finding that following awakenings from REM sleep, people tend to report dreams, whereas they're much, much less likely to do so following non-REM sleep awakenings, awakenings from non-REM sleep. 
And my point here is just going to be that that discovery, it started, it really kicked off both the science of sleep and the science of dreaming, which then later separated again into, into largely independent fields. Um, but also it really brought about a change in the way we think about and conceptualize sleep itself. So I think this quote by Michel Jouvet that I have here really captures that in a quite striking way. So REM sleep, he said, is neither sleeping nor waking. It was obviously a third state of the brain is different from sleep as sleep is from wakefulness. So at least initially to these pioneers of sleep and dream research, the finding that we have a brain that is highly activated in REM sleep and that at least according to EEG of the time looks much like a waking brain. And you also get people reporting dreams following awakening. That, that idea was just incompatible with what sleep was supposed to be. It was so different. So it was almost as if REM sleep dreaming necessitated um, the introduction of a third state of the brain different from both sleep and waking. The traditional view of sleep, so sleep is passive, uninteresting, um, uniform was then largely inherited, I would claim, by non-REM sleep, which just came to be defined also largely as unconscious. So one of the early ideas here was that we could use REM sleep as a marker of consciousness and non-REM sleep as a marker of a loss of consciousness in sleep. And to this day, we find this in attempts to define consciousness operationally as that which disappears in deep dreamless sleep. Uh, and I put this on here because I think what deep dreamless sleep is can be or can be uh, similar to, to the deep stages of non-REM sleep, stage three, but might also be conceived of a slightly different. So I'm just saying these are quite unclear and vague notions at this point. And I think increasingly it's becoming clear that they're all up for grabs. First point is that sleeping, dreaming is now well recognized to be independent of sleep stages. Um, it often occurs in REM sleep though not always, but the bigger problem is that especially in non-REM sleep and especially in the deep stages of non-REM sleep, you kind of get a variety of different types of mental activity. So here's just one uh, example from a study from Fr Francesca Saclari from the Tononi lab, where you can see that especially in N2 and N3, so the allegedly deep and dreamless and unconscious stages of non-REM sleep, you get roughly equal proportions of reports of conscious experience reports um, of unconscious sleep and some in-between state where people say that they had the they have the impression that they had an experience, but they can't recall any details. So this is often also uh, called white dreaming. Um, and the interesting thing that they found, but findings, including findings from work together with now and from from now's group that I've also been involved in, um, seem to point in a different direction, but it's it's very much an evolving field and an interesting discussion at this point was that Saclari et al. found that there was evidence for what they called a parieto, parieto occipital hot zone um, as, a, as a neural correlate of consciousness versus unconscious sleep. And that this hot zone, so this very local localized activity, um, marked the difference between conscious and unconscious sleep. And it did so wet, independently of whether activity in this area occurred in REM sleep or in non-REM sleep. And that, I think, is really a significant, again, theoretical step forward, because it really means that whatever the correlate of, of dreaming is, it's not conventional sleep stages. We need something else. We either need more fine-grained sleep stages, or we need something else entirely. That you can't use conventional sleep stages to diagnose the presence and absence of consciousness. Um, so what about conventional sleep staging? And again, just a few broad points. So what is conventional sleep staging essentially really something worth having? Or what is kind of independent evidence or ideas for refining sleep staging itself? So I think one important thing there to keep in mind is that even how something as coarse-grained and seemingly basic as how, as how many sleep stages there are is very much subject to change. So just a few years ago, it, um, the conventions changed from distinguishing four different substages of non-REM sleep to distinguishing just three. So that's what you would have seen in the Saclari et al. study was um, three substages of non-REM sleep. Um, something that we've been looking at a bit in together with now and, um, and researchers in his group is especially also the fact that sleep and sleep stages tend to be scored contextually. So they're not taken in isolation, but they're scored um, partly dependent on at what point in the night they occur and what sleep stages allegedly preceded, um, preceded them. So this contextual information tends to be quite important to how sleep is scored 
in the laboratory and also scoring rules tend to be defined. And again, this harks back to um, really the introduction of sleep architecture back in the 50s. They tend to be defined in terms of criteria that are open to visual inspection. They're visible to the human eye. Um, and of course, those, those aspects that are visible to the human eye might or might not be the ones that are actually physiologically relevant for distinguishing sleep stages. And um, there's also this thing about sleep typically being scored in 30 second epochs. And it's really one of my favorite examples where this comes from. So this isn't any kind of deep truth about how you carve up sleep and the time window that you use to carve up sleep optimally, but it just has something to do with, with, with how much, um, basically how much you could fit on a piece of printing paper back in the day when um, PSG was still printed out on paper. Um, so again, the point being that there's no reason to think that conventional sleep staging is necessarily uh, always in all respects motivated by, by physiological ground truths about what how sleep is actually carved up. So one project that we um, did that is currently under review, we've just resubmitted it, um, together with now and Chuma Andrian and Nicolas Ricard, Ricard, uh, was an attempt to use an automatic scoring of sleep using this, this library of um, this highly co contrast, highly comparative time series analysis that has a library of 7,700 different features that can then be used to automatically categorize sleep epochs, so, so 30 second sleep windows, and cluster them into um, five different clusters, so waking, REM sleep, and the stages of non-REM sleep. Um, and to see whether that algorithm would basically come up with similar sleep stages to what to the ones that are used in conventional sleep staging. We did find that there was broadly using this feature-based clustering a broad correspondence between our approach and traditional sleep staging, but we also found some evidence of um, sub-stages existing within traditional sleep stages. So some evidence that there might be a more fine-grained way of carving up sleep stages. Um, and just without going into any details here, I think the really interesting thing to take here is that conventional scoring is still kind of the gold standard and benchmark of how sleep is actually staged in, to this day. So that's also why we built in certain comparisons with conventional sleep staging into the study. But it's not necessarily the ground truth of sleep physiology, and it's not necessarily clear that ultimately it, it will be a system worth replicating. Something radically different might be needed. So here's a different way to think about sleep, and I think again that's a quite exciting, um, ex exciting different perspective, and I think it fits in quite nicely with with what I expect Masako will be presenting next. And this is work on local sleep. So local sleep is a fairly new phenomenon. Um, local sleep refers to the the occurrence of slow, usually of slow wave activity, which is typically linked to the deep stages of non-REM sleep, deep sleep. Um, and these, low, these occurrences of slow waves can occur, um, for instance, in REM sleep, so outside of deep sleep, outside of non-REM sleep, or even in wakefulness. Um, and they're local in two ways. They're local both in space and in, in occurring in um, just parts of the brain, and they're also local in time, so they're quite short-lived. So it basically almost looks as if part of the brain were experiencing or having slow wave, we're in a state of slow wave sleep. Uh, slow wave sleep, uh, local sleep, local sleep increases with time spent awake. It's use dependent, so you'll get it in a part of the brain that was previously activated by a particular kind of learning task, for example. And there's, it's also known that it somehow links to, to changes in objective performance. Um, the question that we then asked in this study that was headed by Thomas Andrian and also done together with Nao was whether there, there would also be a link to subjective changes in subjective experience in association with, with the occurrence of local sleep, but also with, um, with where local sleep happened in the brain. And what we were looking at here was the occurrence of local sleep within wakefulness. So people that were awake, participants were doing, engaging with the standard SART task. Um, and whether changes um, specifically between focus on the task and between different kinds of attentional lapses would be associated with the occurrence and location of local sleep activity. Um, so we interrupted uh, participants doing the SART task. We asked uh, a number of questions that we then used to determine whether they were focused on the task, whether they were mind blanking, so having an empty mind, experiencing no thoughts, 
or whether they were engaging in mind wandering, so experiencing racing thoughts, including possibly daydream-like activity, or even just thinking of what they were going to do after the experiment. Um, and then we tried, um, and then we looked at whether this would be associated, yeah, with changes in behavior, but also with occurrences of local sleep. And again, very briefly, what we, thought we found was that mind wandering, so racing thoughts tended to be associated with impulsive behavior and a certain pattern of mistakes during the SART tasks, so commission errors. In other words, people, participants, when they were mind wandering, they tended to um, press um, the go button or the go on too many on, on no-go trials. Um, and they also tended to have local sleep in the front of the head, whereas mind blanking, empty mind, absence of thoughts tended to be associated with sluggish behavior, omission errors, so failure to respond um, on go trials, and also local sleep in the back of the head. So almost as if local sleep in the back of the head and in the front of the head made a difference to mental state, so whether they were mind blanking or mind wandering. Um, and then also, um, yeah, and almost predicting whether what, what mental state they were in. So I think this in itself is quite interesting because it on one hand shows that we have this association of sleep-like activity, slow wave activity occurring in wakefulness that is then linked to a change in subjective experience. And the interesting next point is then that the, the change that is happening in subjective experience is one that again brings us closer or at least into the ballpark of dreaming. So there's quite a lot of new work coming out on dreaming and mind wandering that suggests that dreaming and mind wandering can actually be placed on a continuum. And it's even been suggested that my, dreaming might be an intensified form of waking mind wandering. So it's almost as if um, taking this a bit further, you could speculate that when part of the brain or certain parts of the brain um, exhibit local, local sleep, subjective experience is then almost pushed in the direction of dreamlike experience. Um, so we already know, as I was saying, that local sleep, sleep-like activity can be occurring in wakefulness and might explain some phenomenological continuity. But I think the next step to bring all of this together is then to think in more detail about the subjective and really phenomenological similarities between dreaming and make waking mind wandering in more detail. So again, I'm just going to present a few uh, preliminary results of some work that I've been to doing together um, with Manuela Kierbeck and Jonathan Robinson here at Monash. So this was an experience sampling study um, that was done online. Um, and in this particular setup, what we did is we asked participants to report uh, one dream and one mind wandering episode per day over a period, for, so to a total of 10 days over a period of three weeks. Um, and these were mind wandering episodes that people had caught themselves at. So essentially when they noticed that their minds had wandered once a day and they also had time to do the questionnaire and give a report, then we asked them to do that. And likewise, once the first thing uh, after they woke up in the morning, we then asked them to report a dream and fill in the same questionnaire. So the questionnaire that they then filled out um, for dreaming and for self-caught mind wandering was with very few exceptions, exactly the same questions. Um, and we got a total of uh, 340 responses. Um, and this is just some, some results from the questionnaire study on um, the, the reports are being analyzed separately. So one thing that we found, um, I mean, we had over 20 questions. So this is just a few tastes of the results. Um, they're currently being written up. So one thing that we found is that um, the pattern of the overall quality, the subjective quality of thoughts was actually quite, diff quite similar in dreaming and mind wandering. So if you look here, um, the most um, common things that people said applied to their dreams and waking mind wandering episodes were that they either heard the episode in their own voice or they had pictures or the absolute, the most frequent category that they chose was that they would experience a scene that was typically also visually represented. So typically um, there was this um, either audio or visually visual quality and typically there was even an organization as a scene of something happening as opposed to just an isolated picture or image or pattern um, that they might have experienced. Um, and then when we looked in more detail at how these scenes were experienced in terms of 
relating to, to the self, to the self either in the mind wandering episode or the dream self, the participant in the dream, we again found something that firstly on the side of dreaming and of sleep is quite well known from dream research. So by far the most common way in which people experience their own self in a dream is that they experience themselves as an active participant. Um, they're actively partaking in the dream, moving through the dream world, interacting with the dream world and with other characters in it. Um, they're more rarely passive observers, um, still located within the dream world, but passively observing, passively observing what is happening around them, much as my, my, one might um, observe, you know, something, a play uh, being presented on a stage or something like that. And there's also this category of being an outside observer where they said they weren't really present in the scene, but it was almost as if they were seeing it from the outside. So I, I tend to think of this as a contrast between uh, being present in, in an immersive virtual reality, but silently and passively observing kind of events unfolding around yourself with, without actually taking part, which would be the passive observer. The outside observer would be more one who does not even locate themselves as present inside the scene at all. So again, this is quite familiar um, from dream research, but the interesting thing was that we found a very similar pattern uh, for mind wandering episodes as well. So the most uh, frequent form of self-representation being active participation, um, and then some slight differences that did not reach significance here between being an outside observer, not being present at all, or being a passive observer. Um, when we looked at perspectives, which is a slightly different thing, so what perspective did they have on their own self? Did they see themselves? Did they see the scene as if they were embodied in their body as if they were in, in as it is the case of wakefulness? Or did, did, did they see their own body in the dream from the outside? Uh, or did they have no visual representation of the body? Uh, we found that the first person perspective, the one of being embodied in the dream self was the most frequent one again for both states. Um, but then there seemed to be a difference between having a third person perspective, seeing oneself from the outside, which, um, and this was one of the few things that did in this, uh, for this subset of questions, uh, reach significance, at least in the prune model, that was that people when mind wandering were more likely to have a third person perspective as compared to a fir first person perspective um, than they were in dreams. So the third person perspective was more frequent uh, in mind wandering than in dreaming. And this was a significant difference, even though the most uh, common category was still first person perspective in both in both states. Now, um, I, I picked questions now that all make these states seem quite similar. We also found a number of interesting differences between them. I can return to that uh, in the Q&A if people are interested. But the reason I picked out these particular ones of presence of the self, perspective of the self, overall quality, uh, of the experience is that I think they speak to a way that has become quite common of defining dreams um, that fits in well with the point I want to make next. So um, in dream research, it's long been a problem that different groups have defined dreaming in very different right ways. So people might define dreaming as any experience that occurs in sleep whatsoever, or they might have a very narrow and much more strict view, view of what it is to dream. So having certain kinds of emotionally intense, multimodal visual experiences, experiences involving movement or bizarreness or negative emotions. So Hobson sometimes had this, um, or actually often had this quite narrow view of dreaming as opposed um, to waking and potentially also uh, other experiences in sleep that would then be distinct from dreaming. Um, the view that I like and um, that has been presented by a number of other people is our so-called simulation views of dreaming. And they're somewhere in between. So they don't say any experience in sleep is an experience of dreaming, but they focus on the subset of sleep-related experiences that have a certain structure. These experiences are immersive, much like virtual reality. They're here and now experiences of a virtual self center of a, of a virtual world centered on a virtual self. So as Antti Ravanzuo has put it, there's self in a world experiences. And that phenomenological feature of being in a world is actually very similar in dreams and in wakefulness. It's just that the way it comes about and the way it matches um, the actual environment of the sleeping participant is quite different uh, in both states. Now here and now experience, I think, 
is a nice way to define a certain subset, potentially a subset of experiences occurring in sleep independently of sleep stages. It's something that you would expect and that does indeed seem to occur, uh, not just in REM sleep, but also in non-REM sleep. But it's also something coming back to the preliminary evidence I was presenting from uh, the questionnaire study with Manuel Dakiobak and Jonathan Robinson. Um, it's also something that might even occur in states of mind wandering and specifically of daydreaming. So we might then elect to call the subset of mind wandering that is immersive and involves so-called here and now experience as daydreams. So I think that's an interesting question for the future is do immersive daydreams exist? And if they do, how could we move forward? Um, so I'm conscious of the time. So I'll just again, slowly wrap up and just give one last example of how one could bring these two sides of subjective categories defining uh, subsets of sleep experiences together with refining sleep stages. So here are a few examples from unpublished reports um, from both dreaming and mind wandering from that study that I was mentioning. Um, and one idea would be to really focus on differences, for example, in self-representation or perspective taking within dreams um, or, or mind wandering episodes that are described as involving the experience of a scene and visual imagery. Um, you can see here, at least the differences seem to be quite clear. The language is quite phenomenological, phenomenological, interestingly. So I was hiking with three others. I was in the Victoria Plains along a grassy, rocky fire trail. So clearly active participation of a self. Um, I was a passive observer of things that were happening at the White House um, during the last election. Or here, this last one where there seems to be visual imagery without self-representation. Um, there were just bits of information. They followed each other sequentially, but I wasn't present in the scene at all. It was more just like an image presenting itself. So the language is, I think, quite different. Um, and again, these, these types, I think a really interesting question is if you looked at the reports themselves, and we want to do this actually in the next uh, in future work, if you looked at the reports themselves, would external raters come up with the same categories roughly as the people themselves, as the participants themselves chose in answering the questionnaire? But also you could then ask whether you could have um, identify the neural correlates um, of such shifts in self-representation and presumably uh, immersive versus non-immersive uh, experience in either sleep or waking mind wandering with then uh, substages either of sleep or with uh, specific local spatiotemporal spatiotemporally local changes in sleep activity. Um, and you could imagine this being a nested uh, a nested system of, of different phenomenological categories. So a very coarse brain distinction would be that between having any experience at all versus no experience or no recall of experience whatsoever. A slightly more fine grained one would be here and now experience, having the experience of being present in a world. And then an even more fine grained one would be looking at these differences in self representation. Was it active participation, passive observation, and so on. And you could then ask which one of these best aligned either with occurrences of local sleep or um, which might cut across conventional sleep stages or would they then align better with uh, more narrowly defined um, sub stages occurring within conventional sleep stages. So I think both of those are interesting possibilities. Um, so to wrap up, um, I think the traditional view of sleep, most people would agree on that, is, is, is outdated and something new is needed. But a lot of these traditional views of thinking about sleep, I think, have been preserved in conventional sleep staging and also in modern day theorizing about sleep and sleep stages. Um, it's also commonly accepted that conventional sleep stages are poorly aligned with changes in conscious experience, as well as the presence and absence of conscious experience in sleep. Um, there's also good evidence now that uh, dreamlike activity is occurring in waking as well, so that mind wandering needs to be kind of part of the picture of rethinking sleep um, and sleep-like activity occurring in waking. Um, I think a good goal for the future would be to aim to refine sleep stages and taxonomy of conscious states in sleep in tandem. Um, and on the side of neurophysiology, you might either think about that as, as carving up conventional sleep stages into substages or looking at spatiotemporally local changes that might occur across not just different conventional sleep stages, but across sleep and waking themselves. 
Um, and that might then further be associated with different phenomenological categories um, that are more or less coarse grained. I think taken together, this would really challenge our conventional understanding of sleep, possibly even suggesting that the distinction between sleep and wakefulness itself um, is not is either continuous or something much more complex is needed. Thanks for your attention, um, and I look forward look forward to a discussion. Do you want me to unshare my screen? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'll be sharing. Uh, but uh, do, do you, does anybody have any question to Jenny? Yeah, Aniko, please. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Jenny. It was very, very interesting. I was wondering about this nest study um, that you mentioned. Have you measured or have you asked the participants um, during the mind wandering sessions and the, in the also the sleep session if they had kind of control over their their environment, their their experience? And was there any difference in um, maybe also inter-individual and within individual uh, between the amount of control potentially in sleep and or in mindful or in mind wandering? Yeah, so we had two, thanks for that. So as I was saying, we had over 20 different questions that we asked them in this, uh, in this questionnaire and control was indeed one of them. Um, actually, we had two, we had two different control questions. So one was whether they had the feeling of being able to control. I can't remember exactly how we worded it, but it was basically the feeling of being able to control the, the experience, the episode, either mind wandering or dreaming as it unfolded. And the other question was about deliberately initiating the episode, um, which we did because in the mind, so on one hand, in the dream literature, you obviously have this whole topic of lucid control dreaming and are you able to kind of, uh, author the dream or control the dream as it unfolds. But in the mind wandering literature you have, so Paul Silly has this, a number of studies um, in, on intentional mind wandering where people then intentionally or deliberately initiate the episode of mind wandering, but it then basically unfolds on its own. Um, I can't now remember which one of those, but as you would expect, there was more control uh, for mind wandering than for dreaming. Um, so that, that was definitely a difference. And there were a few, a few more, a few more significant differences. I think overall, so we also had questions about novelty. So novelty was a significant predictor of dreaming. Dreams were more novel than mind wandering. It was interesting to me that they weren't necessarily more meaningful or more useful. Um, so, uh, they were just somehow different from what people had thought or experienced before. Um, so a number of things that we asked, we basically had a dual strategy where we were trying to really have a fairly broad characterization of both states and then taking ideas that had been investigated either in relation to dreaming or in relation to mind wandering and see if they would apply to the other. But really, I think the overall finding was that there was a quite complex picture of both similarities and differences. Um, and it wasn't always the case that dreaming was just more kind of an intensified version of mind wandering. There's a much more complex story there in the background, I guess would be the take home message from them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Steve. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, great talk as always. And um, it's really provocative um, and compelling, compelling work that you do. I, the, the question I have is, um, what sort of reception do you get from the, the people who use sort of pretty traditional uh, sleep stages in their day-to-day -day work, sleep specialists, people dealing with sleep disorders? Um, are they sort of, I mean, I'm sure they're interested in, in your work, but is this idea of really recategorizing, redefining sleep stages, do you get a bit of pushback because of the complexities it may introduce to their work or do they see prospects for better defining sleep disorders and, and um, you know, opportunities for the idea of re restaging sleep? 
I'm not sure. Thank, thanks for, for that question. I think that's a great, I think that's a really great one. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm the person best poised to answer it from the team. Let's put it that way. I think, I mean, so far it's been more from my side of things, at least more of a theoretical proposal and really the work together with Nal and Chilma, um, which has been in every way led and implemented by them has really been uh, more of an attempt to move that forward and to refine that. I think now correct me if, if you see that differently, but I think there is, there certainly seems to be a sense and an acknowledgement is my, is my take that conventional sleep stages aren't necessarily the ground truth of how best to carve up sleep, but obviously all, and, and many other attempts have been made. I mean, also other attempts have been made to uh, automize sleep staging and certainly we're not the first ones to have done that in any way. But I think there is also a concern exactly as you were saying about practicality. Um, I mean, I do think from, but this is really just my personal take that especially if you're looking at sleep disorders, it would be super interesting to have something more fine grained and also something that takes conscious experience on board mm -hmm. more strongly because it's my understanding that um, in sleep disorders, you get conventional sleep staging criteria. I mean, they weren't really designed to be applied to sleep disorders, um, but they're also often just very, when sleep becomes so disorganized, it's actually very challenging to apply them. But then at the same time, it also seems that a lot of the traditional assumptions, for instance, that sleepwalking is just kind of zombie-like behavior, lights out, nobody's conscious, that doesn't really seem to work either. So I guess the huge methodological challenge there is that you don't really have the opportunity or want to do a, a dream study with those participants and how to get around, around that. But at least I think in theory, it could be very interesting and very enticing to basically put fluctuations in consciousness back into sleep research and also back into looking at sleep disorders. Because I think that's really how the two fields started out with this very explicit aim to have found something that could diagnose present and absence of consciousness. And they've kind of moved away from that and not grandiose enough to think that could be turned around. Um, but I do think a more consciousness infused way of defining sleep stages might actually be a very promising way forward. So maybe kind of answer the question. That was good. Excellent, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll add just briefly, but uh, uh, as Jenny also initially uh, said, uh, the traditional sleep uh, scoring is based on the 30 seconds just because it was uh, due to the size of the paper. And uh, nobody right now believes that the brain changes its stage, uh, stages or states over 30 seconds, right? So I don't know. Uh, it will uh, come probably, you know, with um, computational power and those empirical results, uh, like Jenny said, both from the consciousness side and also clinical side, I think. Mm -hmm. I think also maybe following on from now, like one thing I've really been very, found very impressive and learned from now in all of this is the degree to which kind of even the very practical constraints of sleep and dream research hinder the use of really uh, state-of-the-art analysis methods in consciousness research, right? Small sample sizes really prohibit the use of many of the even data analysis methods that, that could be needed to kind of propel the field forward. And that's long before we even look at conscious experience. That's just looking at sleep stages and PSG itself. I think likewise, having high density EEG um, really opens up a whole new way of thinking about not just coarse grained, whole brain changes in brain activity, but much more temporally, spatial, spatially and temporally local ones. So it's really, and I, that, that's also where that database that now you were mentioning in, in the pre-discussion really comes in is this database that now initiated and that we've been uh, building, collecting dream PS, uh, sleep PSG in conjunction with dream reports and really trying to at least solve this basic problem of small data sets that just limit, uh, limit results, really. Mm -hmm. But okay. it's been impressive to me how out of sync the possibilities in sleep research are with 
state-of-the-art consciousness research in large part because of these practical constraints. I think now you're going to have to invent some sort of uh, remote high density um, machine that can be widely applied and get big data sets and and uh, make the revolution happen that way, perhaps. No, not high density EEG, but uh, some kind of headband, you know? Yeah, that's that, what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we already have a kind of portable EEG system. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we can measure brain waves at home easily. So by increasing the number of electrodes, we can get uh, so much data in the natural environment. And then we could probably um, monitor like the brain activities, overnight brain activity changes and the dream reports. And that could be possible even in an at-home environment. So, mm. yeah. yeah. And I was going to add to um, um, Jenny's comment about the um, subjective report. Uh, there's a clinical population, um, which is uh, known as sleep state misperception, SSM. So those people, um, even in the objective, like um, PSG sleep scoring method, um, it looks like they're sleeping very good, but they report they couldn't sleep at all. So this is a sleep state misperception. But um, I was going to agree to Jenny's comment that um, even when uh, this current you know, method um, uh, doesn't allow us to monitor those um, um, like local sleep, perhaps they might be uh, local wakefulness, they might be partially awake. So yeah, we, we need a, a, like better methods, probably by combining um, like a regular traditional polysomnography plus MRI method or yeah, to increase the um, like a spatial yeah, resolution and that, that was, yeah, I was going to agree with uh, Jenny's comment on that. And thanks for that. I think that's super fascinating. I mean, also kind of thinking about, as you were saying, the converse side of local wakefulness and what that might mean. And is that maybe related uh, to certain dream phenomena, to lucid dreaming or something like that? Yeah. And the suggestions are out there. And also just to second what you were saying on sleep misperception, it's, I think one of the examples that really starkly shows that basically sub, what we subjectively experience and describe as sleep can be co almost completely out of sync with what we neurophysiologically define as sleep. And then there's also the, the, the level of behavior, which is also if we look at a number of parasomnias where people exhibit complex behaviors, um, there's kind of also this whole behavioral story of what does and does not look like sleep. And basically behavioral and physiological, neurophysiological and subjective sleep can, can all be almost completely out of sync. And what do you do with those cases? So what, how do we really bring those levels back together? And is that a project worth doing? That's yeah. um, I think a very interesting question. Okay. So um, thank you uh, for the questions. And if you don't have further uh, questions, both uh, here or YouTube, uh, maybe then uh, let's move on to Masako's presentation and then come back to the general discussion if you have any further questions. Masako, can you share the screen? Okay, let me share the screen. Um, can you see my screen, yes, the main yes. window? Yes. Yep. Okay, so uh, my topic is uh, actually about uh, why we can't really sleep well in a new place. And this may um, be related to um, the, what is the, um, what is sleep and how, how do you define sleep? And um, so what is a local sleep status and what is local wakefulness and um, it's, it's my topic might be really relevant to Jenny's um, presentation. So um, first of all, I'd like you to imagine a situation where you are traveling and um, you, you need to sleep in a very new place. For example, in a hotel room, 
um, to attend a conference or at a friend's place, or you just move to uh, your new home. So even when um, you're exhausted, it may take a bit longer to fall asleep. You may wake up in the middle of the night for unknown reason. Or, and then, um, you know, you may think why you can't sleep well. And sometimes you are forced to count numbers, and which doesn't help initiating sleep at all. So eventually you may decide to check your phone or just stay in your bed until the morning. And- um, uh, Masako? So, yes. Sorry. Yes. Do, do you have any mic uh, that is touching something? There is some noise. Oh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not touching anything, but I'll wear, probably I can wear a head, headset and then that may be. It might help. It might help, yeah. Can, can you hear my voice? Uh, you may need to change the microphone. Let me see. Um, yep. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna um check the Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right. Let me share the screen again. It's probably now? better. It's better. Yeah, it's probably better. Yeah, it's probably. Okay, better. okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, this. So, um, you know, you 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 have this um, trouble sleeping in your place, and this actually, um, these sleep problems that occur in an unfamiliar environment are called the first night effects in sleep research, and um, has been known for a very very long time, and um, these have bothered sleep researchers um, these many years because. Um, we we want subject to sleep um, uh, deeply uh, to get good quality data, but the reality is that they can't really sleep well because the environment is so new. And the first effect is uh, only occurs um, specifically specifically occurs in the first sleep session, and um, and usually uh, the on the second night the sleep gets much better. So what we do is to have an adaptation session and then uh, we do the main session on the second day. Um, or uh, many uh, studies actually just include the first night effect uh, to the data and or throw away the data if the quality wasn't good enough. So in our study, um, instead of throwing away the first night data, we decided to investigate it because um, this is really interesting because it occurs even in young and healthy people. So what we thought was that it must be more than just a sleep disturbance. And interestingly, related to um, Jenny's um, presentation, um, many subjects report, even after showing deep sleep, like slow wave sleep, that they were awake the whole time. So there's a discrepancy between um, the subjective uh, feeling of uh, ha having slept and uh, objectively uh, defined sleep. So all of these um, led us to ask these questions that what does our brain do when we suffer from the first night effect? Why we feel like we, we couldn't sleep at all even when we, we were in a really deep sleep. And then um, it feels as if we are partially awake. Are we actually partially awake? Or it's just a, a mere, mere, like a, just a misperception. So these were the initial questions we had. And um, now I'd like to show you an interesting form of sleep. Um, in animals that gave us a hint to investigate the personal effects. 
And actually, so marine mammals and migrating, migrating birds can sleep um, deeply in one of the brain hemispheres and make the another hemisphere more alert or vigilant. And it's, it's called unihemispheric sleep because sleep occurs in one of the brain hemispheres. And this uh, unihemispheric sleep can be measured as the um, intensity of slow wave activity is the um, correlates with the depth of sleep during no, uh, non-REM sleep. And uh, here the um, y-axis shows the um, power of slow wave activity. And these uh, black bars show the um, slow wave activity in the left hemisphere and the white bars show the uh, slow wave activity in the right hemisphere in fossils. So, of course, there is a bilateral slow wave sleep where, where uh, both the left and the right hemispheres show deep sleep. But as you can see, there's also a case where only the left hemisphere shows a uh, larger slow wave activity and also the right, uh, so, uh, right hemisphere sleep where only, only the right hemisphere shows slow wave activity. And so the previous research um, have suggested that this sort of um, unihemispheric sleep or asymmetric sleep is associated with um, like increased uh, requirement to uh, monitor the surroundings when as a protective mechanism. For example, when animals are not sure of the safety, they keep one of the brain hem hemisphere more alert than the other um, to keep watch like a uh, uh, mallard ducks. Um, so, and, and also they show in a hemispheric sleep when they, uh, birds need to fly over the ocean and, uh, you know, they, they need to sleep, but also they need to um, keep flying for over 10, 10 days, nonstop. And this, uh, this, Research on animals um, suggested that perhaps if if this asymmetric sleep is related to um, like monitoring of environment as a protective mechanism, then do humans show asymmetrical sleep in association with the Fresnel effect? Because we don't know whether the um, the place is safe to sleep in both hemispheres. So he, here were the um, initial questions we had. The first one was, does the first night effect involve asymmetrical sleep? And the second question was, if so, which brain regions um, does it occur? One of the brain regions we were interested in was the default mode network. And the uh, default mode network is originally known as the brain regions that show decreases in activity during goal directed um, behaviors. And um, and in, this, in addition, it has been uh, shown that the activation of the default mode network was significantly correlated with um, frequent mind wandering or spontaneous internal thoughts. And um, also the, um, it's, it's been interestingly known that in insomniac patients whose visions might be enhanced during sleep, the brain regions that um, reside in the default mode network showed increased activation during sleep and was correlated with decreased sleep quality. So although hemispheric asymmetry in um, the default mode network was not reported in insomniac patients, um, we, we thought there might be some um, uh, relevance to the, um, the first effect. And also another thing um, uh, is that the home mode network um, is not completely broken during, even during um, deep sleep. So um, it might play a role in the um, surveillance uh, during deep sleep. So, uh, we asked, does the, the homework network show asymmetry of sleep associated with the first night effect? And we did, um, um, we let, allowed subject to sleep in this magnet, MEG, and it's actually different from MRI. Uh, it doesn't produce any um, noises, huge noises. So it's, it's really comfortable for the subject. And we also had um, 
um, EEG and polysomnography method, um, measurements to uh, uh, score the sleep stages. And we also had a structural MRI session um, so that we can um, source localize the slow wave activity to brain regions. And the regions of interest were the, um, in addition to the default mode network, we also investigated um, sensory motor network and um, attention network and the visual network during sleep. Now this shows the uh, slow wave activity in the default mode network um, on day one and day two. And this is the um, left hemisphere and this is blue bars are the right hemisphere. So there was a um, left, left right differences um, on day one and this uh, kind of asymmetry was gone on day two. And we also measured the, um, uh, we investigated whether this asymmetry um, in slow wave activity was correlated with the, a signature of the first effect. So sleep latency is the, is the most robust um, index uh, to monitor the first effect. So, and we found there was a negative correlation between them. So longer sleep latency was associated with larger um, asymmetry mm. in slow wave activity. And such uh, this relationship was gone on day two. Mm. And we also um, monitored, uh, measured the slow wave activity in other brain networks. And we couldn't find, although there was a main um, effect of day, meaning regardless of the brain networks, uh, the slow wave activity was decreased on day one and day two, but we couldn't find any hemispheric asymmetry in other brain regions. So it was specific to the default mode network. Now we next ask if this, um, if this uh, asymmetric sleep was, uh, plays a role in um, monitoring the surroundings, then is the less sleeping hemisphere more vigilant to external stimuli? So what we did was to measure uh, the vigilance. Uh, we examined an auditory evoked brain response during sleep, um, and specifically the uh, component known as N3. So because this N3 component here is uh, this is the suppose this is the onset of sound, and um, this N3 appears only during sleep. So it doesn't, we don't see this brain response during wakefulness. And also it's, it's the largest during slow wave sleep. Mm. And also it responds only to the deviant sounds, which is a rare sound, but not to the um, standard sound. So, and the, the amount of um, this, uh, the amplitude of N3 corresponds to the um, amount of vision. So, we wanted to, we, we decided to measure the um, amplitude of N3 during slow wave sleep to investigate for each of the hemispheres to investigate whether we are actually monitoring in our sleep with the first effect. So um, this, we used the oddball paradigm um, and we presented very, very small sound monorally um, to the left and the right ears every one second. So once in a while, there was this deviant sound, which was a 2000 Hertz pure beep. And um, among these uh, standard sounds, which were um, 1000 Hertz um, pure beep sound. And 90% of the time, um, the sound was uh, standard and only 10% of the time it was deviant. And we made a sound very small so that uh, we can actually measure how brain responds while people were in sleep. We, we were not in this experiment, we were not, uh, we didn't want subject to wake up. We just wanted to monitor what's going on during sleep. So this shows the um, evoked brain response during sleep, slow wave sleep to deviant sound in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And this gray bar shows when the sounds were presented and this is the brain response on day one, and this is on day two. So only on the left hemisphere, the, um, there was a uh, large brain response. 
and in the right hemisphere there is uh, this bump n3 bump here um but it's uh, the amplitude was smaller so we measure the mean amplitude oh uh before that this shows the um uh, ground average uh, evoked brain response to the standard sound um, in the left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and this uh, red is uh, day one, and this um, pink is uh, day two, magenta is day two. So as you can see, it doesn't, the brain doesn't kind of ignores uh, like standard sound. And this is the um, uh, measured mean amplitude, and there is a significant difference between the left and the right hemispheres, and which occurred only on day one to the deviant sound. And this is the standard sound. We don't see much um, uh, brain response to standard sound. So this shows that the left hemisphere, which was sleeping light, lighter than the right hemisphere, was more vigilant than the right on day one. Then finally, uh, we ask, can we wake up and respond faster to external stimuli? Because if the left hem sleeping hemisphere actually plays a role as a protective mechanism, then people, we, we must be able to wake up and respond faster uh, when we detect it, um, like a non-standard non um, stimuli. So in this experiment, what we did was to ask the subject um, to tap their fingers at least three times if they heard beep sound. And interestingly, when, when we ask this uh, to subject, they kind of, they, they look like they're puzzled, like, oh, when I'm sleeping? And then we say, you know, yes, but you'll be fine. And then, um, so what we did was we used the oddball paradigm as the previous experiment. And we started off with a very small sound, but we increased the um, intensity gradually until subjects actually can, could wake up and tap their fingers um, three times. And we place the um, electrode to the index finger and the thumb joint part um, so that we can see this um, tapping movement um, during the experiment. So this shows the um, number of subjects who woke up from the left or the right hemisphere um, trials to the deviant sound. And this is the, um, so as you can see here, most subjects actually woke up when the deviant sounds were presented to their left hemisphere, meaning the right ear. And only a um, small number of subjects who woke up when subject, uh, the sounds were presented to their right hemisphere. And this shows the, um, the uh, behavior response, um, reaction time, um, from the uh, presentation of the deviant sound to the behavioral response. And when the subject woke up and responded to from the left hemisphere, they could actually um, respond much, much faster than the right hemisphere. And this kind of asymmetry was gone on day two. Mm -hmm. So to summarize the results, uh, we found that the left hemisphere was less asleep more vigilant and induced faster behavior response than the right on day one. And this kind of asymmetrical sleep disappeared on day two. And this also occurred only during slow wave sleep. Um, we did see uh, like a um, asymmetry, tendency uh, of asymmetry during stage two, but the, the amount was much smaller than slow wave sleep. Now, um, because of the uh, it's it's at the time, I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of a result of REM sleep. So, we next asked, um, how about REM sleep? And um, we actually didn't couldn't find any asymmetry during REM sleep, and this is a power in delta and theta. But instead, we saw uh, differences within within the um, the phase, uh, which is the um, phasic and tonic period. So by definition, um, there are actually two 
types of REM sleep. And one is called uh, phasic period and another is called tonic period. Phasic period is when um, eyes move a lot and uh, tonic period when um, is when eyes won't move even during REM sleep. So, um, and uh, previous research uh, found that during phasic, during, only during tonic period, um, the brain responds to sound. They didn't say anything about the first effect or the hemispheric asymmetry, but um, it was found that probably the um, uh, processing of external stimuli might be different between these two phases. So we decided to investigate how the brain processes um, the external stimuli during uh, the phasic and the tonic period. And in order to investigate it, we invest, uh, we measure the um, amount of the amplitude of P200, which occurs during REM sleep. So usually this P200 um, occurs only during the, um, not only, but larger during um, the tonic uh, compared to the phasic period. So, um, and we, we don't see N3 um, during REM sleep. That is why we kind of investigated 200 in, in this um, experiment. And um, this shows the P200 amplitude. So we didn't see left, right differences, but instead on day two, this is the um, amplitude uh, during the phasic and blues are the tonic phase. Uh, period. And on day two, as the um, previous research, we, sh we found larger amplitude to the um, during the tonic than the basic. We, we didn't see much um, peak during the basic period. But on day one, this it looked as if the attention spread even to the basic period. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a larger um, amplitude um, to the sound during um, basic period on, uh, between this uh, between day one and day two. So, um, to uh, in in conclusion, um, humans keep one brain hemisphere partially more efficient than the other to monitor environments during non-REM sleep. And although we we don't usually see um, asymmetry when we um, by visual inspection. Um, so in marine mammals and migrating birds, they show kind of conspicuous in hemispheric sleep, but that doesn't usually occur in humans. And um, but still, it looks as if this asymmetric sleep is associated with a sort of um, protective mechanism in humans. And asymmetric sleep emerged during slow wave sleep, and um, so slow wave sleep has been known to have uh, declined responsiveness. So perhaps this uh, symmetric sleep um, uh, exists as a countermeasure to the vulnerability of this um, deep sleep. And we also found increased vigilance during basic REM sleep, this um, associated with uh, dreaming, uh, dreaming REM. So um, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, with that, I'm going to take any questions. Thank you very much. As usual, the sleep experiment is very weird and interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you guys have uh, lots of questions. If you don't, then uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, Sohail, please. Hello. Thank you very much, Kamiki san Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, the question that I have is, uh, you mentioned you consider several different uh, brain networks, one being the attention networks. Interestingly, you found uh, evidence for the default mode networks. Uh, that There are some other studies that show that, uh, like, uh, for instance, anterior cingulate cortex uh, shows this type of activity. But could you have any possible explanation that if this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, the activity that is associated with the sleep is also has a signature of the protectiveness of animal, why we won't see anything in the attention network. Oh, that's an interesting point. Um, we, we don't know. 
um, why it has to be the different one network. Um, probably uh, one of the reason might be that we, we can't, you know, the in uh, we know that when when part of the our brain is used extensively, okay, um, then that part of the brain needs to sleep. Like, yeah. So if the um, attentional network is overly used during wakefulness, it has to shut off during sleep. Mm -hmm. So um, in that case, we may need another system to just keep watch. And that could be, yeah, that could be different from um, like a wakefulness. And that might be one of the reasons that why we have this um, system, yeah. Thank you very much. But maybe I have a kind of follow up question before. Uh, is that OK, Jenny? So if that's the case, uh, then probably in the future experiment, you might want to disentangle or investigate separately be uh, between the kind of the new environment effect during wakefulness and uh, right after the sleep. I don't know whether it's possible or not, but you know, when you go to a new place, let's say, you know, if you go to, let's say, Recam, you know, brain mush, uh, you know, uh, imaging center during the wake, then you might pay a lot of, atten uh, you know, uh, attention to the new things during wake. And then because of that, you know, attention uh, usage during wake, you might have uh, some kind oh, of, you know, asymmetry in the fatigue and that leads to this asymmetry. Interesting. So, um, I see. Yeah, and then, you know, I like you uh, mentioned, you know, with the portable, you know, device. Yeah, yeah. We could potentially, you know, think about something really weird experiment, but uh, after the sleep or, you know, almost going into sleep, you just move into different, you know, environment and then see whether that also induces the asymmetry. Because, you know, the two things are different, right? Like, you know, while you are in the new environment, being alert while sleep versus being alert during wake and as a result to be kind of asymmetric in the sleep. I see. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's um, like a feasible and interesting mm. experiment to investigate how the how our experiences during wakefulness would lead to asymmetry during sleep. Yeah. And when that is in a new or new mm. environment. Yeah. yeah. And also it's really so and this is kind of experiment is really how how do I call it? Um we we didn't control mm. the the you know the newness at all mm. I, I don't know if i'm putting this correctly so mm. um perhaps if we could control the subject's perception or experiences in more details like putting them into a virtual environment yeah virtual reality and then control the um newness like the amount of newness yeah novelty yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and then yeah see what happens um, to the, um, the amount, the degree of, um, asymmetric sleep and that's, yeah, that might be interesting too. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Jenny. Yeah. Thank you. That was super, super, super interesting. Um, thank you so have much. a ton of questions, but I'll try and just maybe ask two, <laughs> maybe <laughs> ask the other one some other time. So I guess coming back or, or continuing on that from that discussion with um, now, uh, it might also be interesting to see to what extent, so you were saying maybe controlling the amount of novelty and that type of thing, but it could also be interesting to think about to what degree a novel environment is really needed. So I guess one yeah. aspect is, do we get this in naturalistic environments as well outside of the lab? But also thinking from my recent experience of being home, you know, with two sick kids and a sick baby over the last week. And I mean, there is research that 
also shows, for instance, that mothers will respond specifically to their own infant crying or something like that. Mm -hmm. It could also be mm -hmm. interesting to see what types of salient stimuli, mm -hmm. uh, including new moms, but also a range of other things, might also lead to unihemispherical differences and something quite similar to the first night effect. So I'd be curious to know if you have any uh, any thoughts on that. So you could almost see, like, is it is it always novelty? Does not a new environment impact sleep in the same way as as a very meaningful stimulus as paying attention to a pet or a different sleeping partner or baby or any variety of things that could also be quite interesting. Yeah, so like investigation of meaningfulness is 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 really difficult because uh, there are several previous research that um, investigated how the brain responds to meaning of sounds. But when we alter the um, the words and then the um, sound properties would change. So, um, so it's actually really difficult to control that sound properties. Um, yeah, and then by changing only the meaning of the sound. So, and the, but interesting, the first thing, um, really, it's it's a really old uh, research, but it was uh, shown that the personal effect is uh, mitigated if we make the room really comfortable and familiar to the subject. So there's an old saying in Japanese that, um, you know, if we change the pillow, we can't really sleep well. So makura ga kawaruto in Japanese. Um, so is it the saying that, or <laughs> is it do you, do you have the kind of the phrase in um, there, Jenny? Do you have that kind of like the changing the pillow or I don't know, changing the pajama? Uh, or, sure, but no? it sounds very convincing. It sounds <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, that kind of so that would uh, mean that if we make if we trick our brain that the even when the room is is noble but by bringing in something that makes you feel familiar mm. you know like um i don't know some some you, you can't it's it's so difficult to carry around your pillow so instead of pillow you can bring something to the room like hotel room then that would mitigate the first effect so mm. yeah Maybe, a, yeah. yeah, maybe related to uh, this one, Jenny's uh, question, uh, uh, Aniko's uh, question. Do you want to speak about that or should I just read? Ba basically, oh, uh, yeah, Aniko is asking whether this kind of first night effect is also similar or different for the uh, oh. doctors or nurses who are expecting on call. Interesting. It could be related um, if if the if the alertness is too high, then we may have to keep both hemispheres alert. Mm. I'm not sure, um, and that would increase the number of um, you know arousals. Mm. It's it's uh, what we have found is a really subtle version of asymmetry and we didn't put subject to wait um that's a that's a actually really interesting point yeah i think it this might is be related it might point, be related yeah. because um in uh so there were um three experiments the first experiment we didn't present any sound and we didn't give any instructions to subject. Mm. They just slept in the scanner. And in experiment three, we instructed subject to respond respond to the sound. Actually, there was a uh, difference between, in terms of the asymmetry between these two experiments. And we, we found more robust um, asymmetry in experiment three when we asked subject to respond. So we only found asymmetry in solvable activity in experiment one um, 
the only when we source localized to the brain region, not on the sensor space, but in experiment two and three, we found this asymmetry um, even in the on the sensor space. Mm. So that means the asymmetry was stronger in this experiment when we ask subject to respond. So perhaps it, it might be, you know, we, we might show this stronger asymmetry when, you know, um, in uh, on-call doctors or not nurses in general, yeah. That's, that would be interesting, yeah. Yeah, very world-relevant question. Yeah, it, it is, yeah. And Jenny, you had also the second question? Uh, I do, but I'm also happy to let Stephen go yeah. and then come back to it, or yeah, maybe it's a very separate question. Let's do that, then uh, Steve first. Thanks. Um, it's fantastic work, um, Masako. I, I, Thank you. I, I read it when I was when when you published it, and with great excitement because I've known about the unihemispheric slow wave um, sleep for a long time, and and my own work um, proposes the idea that that you have interhemispheric asymmetries, activation asymmetries during a waking state, and specifically binocular rivalry, a visual uh, phenomenon. So I've always been looking in the literature for for evidence of attentional interhemispheric asymmetries um, and having known about the the um, comparative literature on, on unihemispheric slow wave sleep it was just so great to see your work come out and and show this sort of thing in humans albeit in yeah. particular environments um, I should also add that I have one hemisphere paying attention to my sleeping baby at the moment because I'm the only one home so <laughs> if I suddenly dash out of the room, that's because the, the hemisphere has picked up that she's crying. But um, so the question that that was just a thank you for your work. But the question then is, if if I think this should be studied more, I think it's really interesting stuff. And I note in your paper, you you, you used MEG. And I think you made some sort of comment about the fact that you were using this MEG was able to get um, identified default mode network and, um, and that if you didn't use such high tech equipment you, you might miss this effect so my question is can we do this without a meg scanner can is there a way where we could study this effect um maybe even if it wasn't sort of isolating where the effect lies specifically you know the the, the, the spatial resolution but if we can just identify that it's occurring using more standard eg equipment more standard equipment you'd see in sleep labs um, uh, that, that don't have a, a MEG scanner? I think that's possible. And uh, it, if you if you put the subject to a state where they need to keep watch stronger than possibly, you know, sleeping in the chamber, I, I think that's possible. So it's related to the previous um, question. Um, I think because for example, if you instruct subjects such as, you know, if you heard any strange sound, please wake up and respond. And that would give one of the brain hemispheres more alert than the other. I, I think that's that might be possible, although we didn't test without the first effect. So it's it would be interesting to find out. Yeah. But another thing I'm not sure is which hemisphere will be more vision hmm. um, than the other. We found it was the left hemisphere that showed increased vigilance, but uh, and there are two. There might be two possibilities. Uh, one possibility is the um, other vigilant hemisphere may alternate across sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we 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 are not sure because we could only get the um, first sleep cycle data. We we couldn't monitor for. Us. A long time in the scanner, so we we could only measure um, sleep during the first sleep cycle. Um, it's possible the left hemisphere vision during the first sleep cycle, and they may switch to the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another possibility is that because uh, the left hemisphere shows stronger functional connect connectivity than the right, it might be um, useful to keep watch. If to if we have the left hemisphere more alert than the right, 
there, yeah, there are two possibilities. We, yeah, we don't know the answer to this question. I see. And so, the, that yeah. partially answers Angus's question, I guess. Angus was asking that uh, why specifically left hemisphere. Oh, yes, yes. And, that's, uh, yeah, that's answers, yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm missing the um, question. Yes. I but, think, yeah, that would be my answer to the first question. But he was also asking whether it's expected from the unihemispheric sleep oh, no, in other but, animals. Um, it's actually, in animals, the uh, visual hemisphere alternates. Hmm. So it's kind of, you know, sometimes it's the left hemisphere that's sleeping and the right hemisphere is sleeping. So it can occur in um, either of the brain hemispheres, yeah. I'd make a point on that, that in, in, if you look at the lesion data, um, the, the, the right hemisphere, if anything, tends to be the one that's looking for discrepancies. Um, so when you have a, a left hemisphere lesion and the right intact, um, you, you become, you're more likely to become depressed, for example, and, and one of the features of depression is you're, you're, you're constantly worried about things, you're looking for all the faults and all the discrepancies and you're constantly vigilant. And then if you have a right hemisphere lesion and the left hemisphere is still active, you're more likely to be emotionally fatuous and laughing and possibly even manic. Oh, and that, that's the opposite with smoothing over discrepancies um, wow. and, and sort of just ignoring problems. Um, so if anything, if I was to ask to make a prediction, if there was one hemisphere that stays awake, I would have thought it would be the right hemisphere. Mm. But I think what you said earlier makes a lot of sense that if you follow it through the night, my guess would be they'll alternate um, and they'll each take turns at, at being awake. That would be my my prediction. But it'd be it would be great to get that answer at some time. Yeah, that's so interesting. Because the brain hemispheres, they're not really, you know, um, they're different. We, we we feel as if we have two brains. That's it's these, yeah, this, you know, language or attention, and as like you mentioned, um, left hemisphere is more depressed than the right, and it's so interesting. So I've been telling people just to look at each um, hemisphere um, separately, but still, many people just combine these two yeah, mm. together, and it's yeah, we may be missing this, you know, interesting phenomenon. Thank you so much. So Thank interesting. You. Okay. Now maybe Jenny before Sohel, I think. Um, I would like to come back to that whole question of uh, sleep misperception and how this might or might not be linked to disorders, sleep disorders, and if anything is known about that. So I guess one group of questions would be around whether there were any anecdotal reports in your study of uh, you know, people, if they showed a stronger effect, being more aware in the morning, having, I think you indicated at the, in the beginning of the presentation, that they might say they didn't sleep, like, was that, yeah. is your sense they were more aware of having done the tapping, uh, finger tapping, you know, were there differences there? I guess another question that um, comes back then to sleep disorders is, do you think having if if there is such an effect with awareness being associated with changes in unihemispherical sleep um would we or would you think or would you speculate that maybe looking at the first night effect might even be a way to to study or make progress on uh insomnia and sleep misperception but in a healthy population like could we generalize that research to clinical populations, or might it be interesting to make that type of a comparison? Because surely those those populations would be more accessible. And I guess the last question in that group of questions would be, I've heard, um, I don't know if this is anecdotal or if there's solid research on this, but that people with sleep disorders and including insomnia will often say that they sleep better in the sleep lab yeah. and that kind of the sleep disorder almost disappears, which might come back to that, what you were saying earlier of feeling that they're sleeping in a safe environment. So paradoxically they sleep better and then you don't actually observe um, right. the sleep disorder um, when you were trying to study it. So yeah, I guess kind of all of those things 
coming together like specifically would would this work with the first night effect i guess be be a way to to potentially make progress towards understanding this perception and insomnia as well yeah that's um thank you so much for your questions um i i tr i'm trying to answer um so some clues about what's going on with the you know clinical in the clinical populations by using the first night effect yeah because um um it's one one of the difficulties in investigation of the clinical population is that they usually have other um psychological or neurological um, problems like uh for sleep uh, when people have sleep disorders, they are depressed and they have anxiety disorders. And also they are taking medications. So all of these would, um, um, yeah, would be confounding factors if you want to understand what's going on with the sleep disorders. So, yeah. And um, oh, the reverse first night effect, it's really interesting because um, when people for the insomnia patients, it's usually they they are kind of um, learning that the environment cannot make them so. They are learning the association between the environment and the state of being not be able to sleep. So, but by putting them into a new place, that um, association will be gone, so they can sleep better in a new place. It's called the reversed person effect. So instead of the uh, typical person effect, people who have troubles sleeping in their own home can sleep better in a new place. Yeah, so, um, and for the, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm an, um, answering your questions, but um, I'm going to say about the awareness. So, um, I feel like this uh, local awake state in the brain hemisphere is relevant to how we perceive our sleep, you know, how we feel um, our sleep. But um, because interestingly, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, um, most many subjects say, um, oh, I'm so sorry, I couldn't sleep at all. Um, but the, when we look at the data, they're showing slow wave sleep a lot. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think it's relevant, but we don't have much data on that, uh, how it may be related to, yeah, asymmetric sleep. Can, can, can I just uh, add a quick comment on this uh, reverse first night effect? I'm also really fascinated by that. But uh, I was wondering, uh, upon uh, hearing, you know, your presentation that uh, maybe the imbalance during the wakefulness of these you know insomnia people is actually causing the imbalance during the sleep that leads to insomnia oh because of the imbalance of the kind of usage of yeah 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 that, right? in the normal environment but when you go into the you know, when these you know insomnia people oh. go to the new environment uh, they are kind of you know uh, again sort of uh, excited about new things and then that yeah. kind of normalize the fatigue of both hemisphere and that <laughs> so leads to yeah so it's like you know <laughs> uh, but but i think this is actually plausible because um, you yeah. know neglect or extinction you know brain lesion uh, patients who um, lose this attention on one side they get actually better if the second lesion comes in the other hemisphere you yeah. know, it's called the Sprague effect. I see, I see. So, you know, it, it may be the case that insomnia people may be not impaired in something, but maybe it's the imbalance that is causing this. So if you make them further fatigued or, you know, excited more, then that might actually normalize the balance or something like that. I see. That's um. That's in interesting, and also it will be a feasible study. Oh. Um. We we just uh we probably um. Yeah, we we have to monitor the brain activities while those um, you know, 
people are awake and mm. then detect the imbalance the amount of imbalance or how, how the how the brain ne networks are used during wakefulness mm. and uh, sort of um we, we once we detect that imbalance and then uh, we kind of uh, train the subject to use a particular network or brain region mm. because i can and imagine then, yeah, yeah. Mm. Because I can imagine that the insomnia clinics or insomnia study would probably target the brain activity during sleep, right, Jenny? Right, yeah. But if they look at, the, you know, activity in wakefulness, then maybe that's the cause of this, you know? Right, be, not be able to sleep, yeah. yeah. Sleep well. I don't yeah, know, maybe this is a crazy idea, but... Uh... Yeah, yeah, that's that would be interesting um, research, I think, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so hey, I, I <laughs> let you wait. No, it's totally fine now. Uh, thank you again. And I think my, my question was going to be related to what the Stephen was pointing at. And uh, there are basically two points in it. One, uh, Stephen was putting an emphasis uh, on the based on his uh, view that uh, it might be the right uh, hemisphere to be expected, or at least he was expecting. But would the observation that you're making, and it's going towards the, the novelty and being paying attention and being kind of um, uh, like monitoring the environment relate to what Gazaniga's study has been showing about the interpreter left hemisphere? Uh, oh, yeah. that, is the part, that is the part that has been actually uh, like monitoring everything. Uh, and then the second part would be the, uh, what again, Stephen mentioned that would it be uh, possible to do this uh, or to replicate these studies using less expensive devices. Do you think if somebody is going to be using EEG, the change in the alpha beta uh, frequency uh, as of a, a sign of the attention could be considered uh, as of what you have observed of uh, people during the sleep, waking up, and uh, due to the novelty, paying more attention? Do you think uh, the monitoring this uh, alpha beta uh, uh, switching uh, could be an option in order to 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 replicate or to to continue these studies using devices such as EEG. I see. Um, so the yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I I think uh, we I think we might have investigated um, other frequency bands. Um, including uh, alpha um, and beta bands, uh, we I don't think we found any asymmetry. We also we we found only in the uh, soul wave activity band during um, uh, soul wave sleep, and um, so it might be specific to this yeah band. And um, also during uh, REMC, we did investigate alpha um, power, but we didn't see uh, the, uh, yeah. And the left hemisphere, it's, uh, is it in the, um, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, probably if that's the case, um, the left hemisphere might be the, um, you know, the, the, the brain hemisphere that's always observing uh, the surrounding and it, it may not switch to the the other the right hemisphere if that is the case the asymmetric sleep in humans might be completely different from marine mammals mm, mm, mm. it might yeah it might be specific to humans but yeah that's one of the interesting possibilities that yeah i don't have uh, unfortunately i don't have the answer to your um, point but that's yeah really interesting to find out if the um, less sleeping or visual hemisphere um, switches, alternates uh, during sleeping humans or not. And that, that might um, answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Is there any further questions? Maybe you, you might need to leave, but I, I have a pressing question for, to both of you. Why do you think we need to actually sleep in both hemispheres if we have a you know, capability to sleep one hemisphere at a time? Because, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, it seems it doesn't really make sense to lose consciousness, you know. Uh, if we can sleep, you know, one hemisphere and then continue to be alert you know, all the time. 
So yeah, you, I wish I could sleep in you know one of the brain hemispheres. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, uh, working the other. <laughs> right. Many people probably think about that, you know, like especially for those who are studying for the you know university entrance exam or something like that. They want to probably wake you know one hemisphere at a time or something like that. But one one possibility was that about you know like insomnia kind of or mis mis uh, sleep misperception kind of thing if we can't uh restore the feeling of fatigue unless you sleep globally then maybe you know that may be the i don't know cost to pay for the entire uh, hemisphere but uh, it's really some, uh, strange for me to yeah realize the fact that you know we need to sleep as a whole and then make us quite dangerous you know yeah it's uh, still we we are really not no one knows mm. what good sleep is at all like yeah and um and recently there's a, a research that showed um it's it's the it's it's REM sleep that uh, makes us feel like we slept deeply not mm. so much sleep mm. yeah oh, i see so traditionally people thought it's so much sleep that makes us feel slept well oh, i see but it, it may not be the case it might be REM sleep Oh. And yeah, so yeah, I don't have any. I'm sorry, I I'm not answering your question, but it's it's it may not be. Yeah, so we we'll see. Might be just uh, perhaps just clear cle clearing the um, waste product, mm. and it doesn't. It may not contribute to a feeling of sleep slept mm. at all. It may be REM sleep that plays a role in our subjective. Well, that, that also yeah. leads to the same question, right? Like if we have a mechanism to do the local sleep everywhere, mm -hmm. depending on the mm -hmm. fatigue of the location, mm -hmm. then, you know, we could actually have a local sleep as necessary. And then we don't need to sleep. Like uh, globally. Globally. Yeah. We may not, that, that might be true, actually. We may not have a global sleep at all. Hmm. Because sleep can be controlled locally. Mm. Yeah, so. I don't know if Jenny has any. <laughs> we may not have or... a global sleep at all. <laughs> if I can just come in on that, it seems like the kind of question where one ought to have a really good answer, but I kind of feel similarly stumped as I, it's. it's kind of seems we there there isn't that answer yet i mean also functions of sleep really isn't my my expertise so i'm probably not speaking from great uh research background there but it i guess what i would say is in my to my mind that as our understanding of sleep and sleep stages shifts and as our understanding, for example, shifts from thinking that sleep is a whole brain phenomenon to seeing that it's actually largely locally orchestrated and that local sleep, potentially also wakefulness plays a huge role and possibly that it's always locally orchestrated rather than global. I think as that understanding shifts, I think we'll also actually need to update theories um, and potentially experiments as to what sleep is for and what function if any it actually fulfills and similarly so for dreaming mm. so i think again not not even attempting to answer that but i'm just saying how we think about those questions is actually going to change as alongside our understanding of what sleep is and i think that's a quite interesting um interesting situation in itself i see one other thought, but this is really just a footnote um, on the functions of dreaming, which I think are equally, and it's a very controversial field with different contenders. And I think none of them, a few of them very, very popular. I, I haven't been convinced by any single one. Um, I think there is, there is an older theory that might be of interest there that I think was called the Sentinel theory, which was kind of saying that dreaming is there 
because a dreaming has the function um REM sleep dreaming of kind of making you more able to engage with the environment so it's kind of like waking you up again and again but it's I mean again against that again then you could say well in REM sleep or at least certain parts of REM sleep you seem to be maximally divorced from the environment so I'm not but there are those types of theories there as well so that kind of fits in with the story but I'm um, again not 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 sold on it yeah, so I, I was going to ask Jenny, um, do you think um, dreaming has any role? Um, or do we just dream because we put meanings to it? I would say, kind of similarly to what I was saying before with sleep and our changing understanding of sleep and how that will impact how we think about the functions of sleep, I would say Generally, I think it's plausible that that not just sleep stages, but also dreaming serve a number of different functions. But I think firstly, I would assume that it's not just a single thing. And I think kind of any theory that is kind of too narrow on the functions of dreaming will I think miss a lot of interesting, will kind of misconstrue the target phenomenon, but also kind of misunderstand that consciousness likewise doesn't have a single function. That's mm. part of the interesting part about it. And likewise, I think consciousness and sleep won't have one single function, but many. But I also think that just as we're kind of moving towards a picture where dreaming is can be placed on some kind of continuum um, with mind wandering and spontaneous thought and waking, likewise, I think we then also should move away from the idea that whatever function, if any, is performed by, by dreaming um, is kind of unique <laughs> and exclusive to dreaming. Likewise, yeah. if sleep and waking are continuous and you get local wake and sleep and local sleep and wake, likewise, then the function of sleep and wakefulness will not be completely distinct, but possibly quite complementary. So I think it just kind of changes how we view those contributions. Thank you. Now, one issue picking up on your point about, um, you know, why we don't alternate all the time, I guess, is is we're paralyzed for parts of our um, sleep cycle. So, um, you know, and, and, and well, I believe, I, I presume that's in, in REM sleep, which is not where we see the the, uh, the unihemispheric activity, but we it may be difficult to coordinate, um, you know, paralyzing half of your body um, in in humans, and and, and conversely, that even the the marine mammals that do unihemispheric slow wave sleep, they spend some time doing bilateral sleep, so there may be some physiological function for bilaterality of sleep at least part of the night. Um, so yeah, anyway, just a couple of extra thoughts on the issue there. Yeah, ma makes sense, actually. Um, of course, you know, some of the functions are definitely bilateral, so you need to sleep uh, bilaterally. So yeah, okay, that makes sense. All right, uh, with that, uh, if I, I think yeah, you were pretty generous in having this, you know, all this discussion um, until right now, so I'm quite happy. Uh, it was very interesting discussion, especially towards the end. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank and you I so think, much. Yeah, I yeah, think this thank was you. This was really fun. Yeah, yeah it was really great, yeah. great exchange with with you, Masako, but also all of the questions, and it's really uh, been a lot of food for thought. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll just stop the YouTube stream. Uh, uh, by YouTube. All right, so YouTube is now finished.